Hey students, it's me again. Hope you're not sick of hearing my voice today. But I wanted to touch base because I was looking at your responses to the question I posted, which is, what does this excerpt from Jackson Benson's biography tell us about Cannery Row? Like, what do we learn about Cannery Row from this piece? And I want to say that most of your answers were a little bit general, right? One of the things you can always ask yourself when you're writing is, am I being specific? Am I really giving details or am I just kind of talking in generalities? Um, and so for many of the answers, it's like you could have read something totally different um, and be talking about that. And I wouldn't know because there's really no details in it. So um, there's a lot of background here and I think you'll understand it more if I talk you through it. So I'm going to talk to you about this little excerpt here. And hopefully you can go back then and revise your answer into something more concrete, more specific, a little more insightful. So let's start here where I have this little um, highlight and I'm going to mark this up with you. So follow along and I'll try to keep it pretty brief. So we start off where Steinbeck writes a letter to his friend Duke and Duke is one of his friends from Stanford. And that's before Stanford was like a big Ivy League, you know, it was a California country school. And here's the letter. I finished the book called Cannery Row. It will be out in January. If Pat Cavici, that's his editor, sends me an extra proof, I'll send you one. I don't know whether it is effective or not. It's written on four levels and people can take what they can receive out of it. So I would have you highlight that. He says that the book is written on four levels. So that's like a pretty cool thing to say. What four levels are we going to get out of this book? I'm going to put a question mark here so we can come back. So we'll say four levels to the book. What are those? One thing I've been talking about in this um, so far is like levels of questions you know going from a summary sort of story level to critical thinking to making connections that kind of stuff it doesn't mean that per se um, but he means that there's four levels of thinking here or maybe four layers of theme or, or whatever it is that, that you want to see so be thinking about that as we read one thing, it never mentions the war, not once. And that's a pretty fantastic thing to say because this is the end of the war. And if you had lived through World War II, that's the biggest event of your life. You know, um, nothing's ever going to be as big as that. Every part of your life was the war. And to write a book in that time period that is so outside of the war it was pretty amazing. So I would definitely highlight that and then say something about it. We can say World War II, um, not mentioned, not discussed in the book. You'll find a lot of old things in it. I may go back to extensions of things we talked about years ago. Maybe we were sounder then. See, there's a kind of nostalgia there for the past, right? The past is simpler. Maybe in this case it was. Certainly we were thinking more universally. And I think about that. The crap I wrote overseas had a profoundly nauseating effect on me. Among other unpleasant things, modern war is the most dishonest thing imaginable. So you see someone who's pretty disgruntled with, um, with the war and the way things have been happening. The crap that he wrote overseas was propaganda mostly. He wrote propaganda for the U.S. Army and some of it was kind of good. The Moon is Down is one of those and I wrote those teaching materials. Um, but, you know, you read it as propaganda. Let's see what else he says. Um... 
oh, this is really wonderful here. So I want you to, I'm going to get my highlighter here. And I want you to think about this. So this is Jackson Benson saying this. In a way, it was a summation, the book Cannery wrote, as a summation of all Steinbeck's conflicts and contradictions. And this is really great here. Watch. It was funny and deadly serious, at the same time sentimental and coldly deterministic, loving and satirical. Let me see. Hang on. I want to move this up here. Lyrical and yet very precise. So that's pretty insightful thing to say. Lyrical and very precise. Yeah, that's pretty intense. So this kind of juxtaposition or this dichotomy or this strange, yeah, I think that strange con contradiction, you're going to see that in the book a lot. And I want you to mark that and I want you to think about it. So I'm going to say contradictions in the book. Um, some ways the book's very beautiful and and joyous, and sometimes it's very sad and and horrific. So keep that in mind. Let's see what else Steinbeck says about the book. Um, mm -mm -mm. Yeah, up here. If you look up here, it's about a life once lived. Friends once loved in a place indelible in memory. So Canary Row is really about a time in his life. Time in John Steinbeck's life. And it's one that he's thinking a lot about uh, during the war. At the end of the war, he's looking back and saying, was that a great time? You know, um, I'm going to say he's sort of looking back. It's kind of in an homage to that time in his life. He captures it. It's beautiful. And all of these beautiful passages are taken from are taken from um, the prologue, I'm pretty sure. And then I want to touch on this right here. The mythical hero. Doc has the hands of a brain surgeon in a cool warm mind doc tips his hat to dogs as he drives by and the dogs look up and smile at him goes on and on his mind had no horizons his sympathy had no warp i mean what a character and remember doc is modeled after steinbeck's actual best friend ed ricketts and ed ricketts like i had mentioned is a kind of um renaissance man and i want to actually show you something fascinating so this is from the smithsonian in washington dc and i know some of you have been there look right here edward f ricketts pacific gulf of california so this is just one of i think 25 specimens that ed ricketts has at the smithsonian so our own government has um, you know, kept the things that he collected as, as their example of that thing having had existed or, or, uh, and so on. So I thought that was kind of fascinating, just a little piece. Marine biology actually features a lot into his and Steinbeck's work. And so if you like ocean, if you like marine life, if you like anything biological, then I think, um, you really have a lot of fun with Steinbeck. And so finally, let's wrap this up looking here at the end. The myth evolved during scores of evenings when he told his wife bedtime stories of Gabe, who was Mac in the book, and the boys, Flora's place, who's Dora, and Wing Chong's, which is really uh, Lee Chong's in the book, and Ed and the lab and the people who gathered there. So the stories that we're going to read about are real stories that Steinbeck would tell his wife, Gwen. And he later went on to write a book where Gwen is in it, and she's like the most evil person ever because they had an acrimonious divorce. Um, but yeah, these are real people. He kind of mythologizes them. Let's see if I can spell that here. 
kind of mythologizes these people. There's a King Arthur, an Arthurian kind of celebration of, of this. But let's highlight some other things here. Um, it connected to Steinbeck's life in a number of ways beyond the creation of a myth out of nostalgia. So it's not just nostalgia. And although it doesn't mention the war, it is Steinbeck's war novel. I want you to keep thinking about that. It was born out of the discovery of his own mortality and out of the haunting question, why does a little girl have to be blown up? Think about that as we read, right? It's a kind of the, the basics of war. Horrible things happen. Why do they happen? What is life? What is death? And what do they mean? These are the big questions, right? So let's write that. These are the big questions in life that we all have and struggle with, especially when you're about your age. I think is when you first really start to think of these things. The answers are simple. Life is process. Death is a part of life. Neither life nor death means anything. They simply are. And the important things in life are love and beauty, which bring joy to the process of living. So that is essentially Steinbeck's philosophy right there. I want you to highlight that. If I were you, I would put this in your reader response journal, your notebook. I would go put that there. That is Steinbeck's thing. It's not the why of life. It's, uh, it's the how. That's, that's what I would say is more important to him. He's more interested in the process of the journey, so to speak. I think that's why he wrote so many road novels or stories of like road trips. Um, so that's it. You know, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction and read this again, look at my crazy annotations and see if you can make any more connections. And once you finish this, make sure you go and read the prologue. Go and read that and, uh, and let me know what you think. Good night.